Good morning, 5A. Right, here we are. We are going to carry on with the next chapter of Howl's Moving Castle. Um, you might remember in the last castle, Michael and Sophie were kind of stuck on a spell and they were out in the marshes trying to uh, catch a falling star to, um, to get it, uh, to, to make the spell work. It didn't quite work. Anyway, as usual, um, book is in the uh, in the comments in the in the, in the, uh, the description um, this is chapter 10 uh, if you do if you do control and control F to search and look for 10 you'll find it chapter 10 in which calcifer promises Sophie a hint Hal must have come back while Sophie and Michael were out he came out of the bathroom while Sophie was frying breakfast on calcifer and sat gracefully in the chair, groomed and glowing and smelling of honeysuckle. Dear Sophie, he said, always busy. You were hard at work yesterday, weren't you, in spite of my advice? Why have you made a jigsaw puzzle of my best suit? Just a friendly inquiry, you know. Well, you jellied it the other day, said Sophie. I'm, I'm making it over. Oh, I can do that, said Howell. I thought I showed you. I can also make you a pair of seven-league boots of your own if you give me your size. Something practical and brown calf, perhaps? It's amazing that one, one can take a step ten and a half miles long and still always land in a cow pad. It may have been a bull pad, said Sophie. I dare say you found mud from the marshes on them too. A person my age needs a lot of exercise. You were busier than I realised then, said Hal. Because when I happened to tear my eyes from Lottie's lovely face for an instant, I could have sworn I saw your long nose poking around the corner of the house. Mrs Fairfax is a family friend, said Sophie. How was I to know you would be there too? You have an instinct, that's how, said Hal. Nothing is safe from you. If I was to court a girl who lived on an iceberg in the middle of an ocean, Sooner or later, probably sooner, I'd look up to see you swooping over the head on a broomstick. In fact, by now, I'd be disappointed in you if I didn't see you. Are you off to the iceberg today? Sophie retorted. From the look on Letty's face yesterday, there's nothing that need keep you there. You wrong me, Sophie, Hal said. He sounded deeply injured. Sophie looked suspiciously sideways. Beyond the red jewel swinging in Hal's ear, his profile looked sad and noble. Long years will pass before I leave Letty, he said. And in fact, I'm off to see the king again today. Satisfied, Mrs Nose? Sophie wasn't sure she believed a word of this, although it was certainly to Kingsbury, with the doorknob red down, that Howell departed after breakfast, waving Michael aside when Michael tried to consult him about the perplexing spell. Michael, since he had nothing else left to do, left as well. He said he might as well go to Chesedy's. Sophie was left alone. She still didn't truly believe what Howell had said about Letty, but she'd been wrong about him before, and she only had Michael and Calcifer's word for Howell's behaviour after all. She collected up all the little blue triangles of cloth and began guiltily sewing them back into the silver fishing net that was all that was left of the suit. When someone knocked at the door, she started violently, thinking it was the scarecrow again. Port Haven door, Calcifer said, and with flashing a purple grin at her. That should be all right then. Sophie hobbled over to it, blew down. There was a cart horse outside, and a young fellow of fifty who was leading it, wondered if Mrs Witch had something which might stop it casting shoes all the time. I'll see, said Sophie. She hobbled over to the grate. What shall I do? she whispered. Yellow powder, fourth jar along on the left, Calcifer whispered back. Those spells are mostly belief, so don't look uncertain when you give it to him. So Sophie poured yellow powder into a square of paper, as she'd seen Michael do, twisted it smartly and hobbled to the door with it. There you are, my boy, she said. That'll stick the shoes on harder than a hundred nails. Do you hear me, horse? You won't need a blacksmith for the next year. That'll be a penny, thank you. It was quite a busy day. Sophie had to put down her sewing and sell, with Calcifer's help, a spell to unblock drains, another to fetch goats, something to make good beer. The only one that gave her any trouble was a customer who pounded on the door in Kingsbury. Sophie opened it red down, 
to find a richly dressed boy, not much older than Michael, white-faced and sweating, wringing his hands on the doorstep. Madam Sorceress, for pity's sake, he said, I have to fight a duel at dawn tomorrow. Give me something to make sure I win. I'll pay any sum you ask. Sophie looked over her shoulder at Calcifer, and Calcifer made faces back, meaning there was no such thing ready-made. That wouldn't be right at all, Sophie told the boy severely. Besides, duelling is wrong. Then just give me something that lets me have a fair chance, the lad said desperately. Sophie looked at him. He was very undersized, undersized and clearly in a great state of fear. He had that hopeless look of a person who always loses at everything. I'll see what I can do, Sophie said. She hobbled over to the shelves and scanned the jars. The, what, the red one, labelled Cayenne, looked the most likely. Sophie poured a generous heap of it onto a square, square of paper, and she stood the human skull beside it. Right, you must know more about this than I do, she muttered. The young man was leaning anxiously round the door to watch. Sophie took up a knife and made what she hoped would look like mystic passes over the heap of pepper. You are to make a fair fight, she mumbled. A fair fight, understand? And she screwed up the paper and hobbled to the door with it. Throw this in the air when the duel starts, she told the undersized young man, and it will give you the same chance as the other man. After that, whether or not you win depends on you. The undersized young man was so grateful, he tried to give her a gold piece, but Sophie refused to take it, so he gave her a two-penny bit instead, and went away whistling happy. I feel like a fraud, Sophie said as she stowed the money under the half-stone. Not that I'd like to be there at the fight. So would I, crackled Calcifer. When are you going to release me, so I can go and see things like that? Well, when I've got even a hint about this contract, Sophie said. You may get one later today, said Calcifer. Michael breezed in towards the end of the afternoon. He took an anxious look round to make sure Howl had not come home first, and went to the bench where he got things out to make it look as if he'd been busy, singing cheerfully while he did. I envy you being able to walk all that way so easily, Sophie said, sewing a blue triangle to silver braid. How is my... my niece... Michael gladly left the workbench and sat on the stool by the hearth to tell all about his day. Then he asked about Sophie's. The result was that when Howell shouldered the door open with his arms full of parcels, Michael was not even looking busy. He was rolling around on the stool, stool laughing at the story about the dual spell. Michael backed into the door to shut it and leaned there in a, in a at tragic attitude. Look at you all, he said. Ruin stares me in the face. I slave all day for you all, and not one of you, even Calcifer, can spare the time to say hello. Michael sprang up guiltily, and Calcifer said, I never do say hello. Is something wrong? asked Sophie. That's better, said Hal. Some of you are pretending to notice me at last. How kind of you to ask, Sophie. Yes, something is wrong. The king has asked me, officially, to find his brother for him with a strong hint that destroying the Witch of the Waste would come in handy too, and you all sit there and laugh. By now it was clear that Howell was in a mood to produce green slime any second. Sophie hurriedly put her sewing away. I'll make some hot buttered toast, she said. Is that all you can do in the face of tragedy? Howell asked. Make toast? No, don't get up. Don't get up. I've trudged here, laden with stuff for you. The least you can do is show polite interest. Here and he tipped a shower of parcels into Sophie's lap and handed another to Michael. Mystified, Sophie unwrapped several things. Pairs of silk stockings, two parcels of the finest cambric petticoats with flounces, lace and satin insets, a pair of satin side, a pair of elastic sided boots in dove grey suede, a lace shawl and a dress of grey watered silk trimmed with lace that matched the shawl. Sophie took one professional look at each and gasped. The lace alone was worth a fortune. She stroked the silk of the dress, awed. Michael unwrapped a handsome new velvet suit. You must have spent every bit that was in the silk purse, he said ungratefully. I don't need this. You're the one who needs a new suit. Howell hooked his boot into what remained of the blue and silver suit and held it up ruefully. Sophie had been working hard, but it was still more holes than suit. 
How selfless I am, he said, but I can't send you and Sophie to blacken my name to the king in rags. The king would think I didn't look after my mother properly. Well, Sophie, are the boots the right size? Sophie looked up from her, from her awed stroking. Are you being kind, she said, or cowardly? Thank you very much, and no, I won't. What ingratitude! Howell exclaimed, spreading out both arms. Let's have green slime again, after which I would be forced to move the castle a thousand miles away and never see my lovely Letty again. Michael looked at Sophie imploringly. Sophie glowered. She saw well enough that the happiness of both her sisters depended on her agreeing to see the king, with green slime in reserve. You haven't asked me to do anything yet, she said. You've just said I'm going to. Howell, Howell smiled. And you are going to, aren't you? All right, she said. What, when do you want me to go? Tomorrow afternoon, said Michael. My, said Howell. Michael can go as your footman. The king is expecting you. He sat on the stool and began explaining very clearly and soberly just what Sophie was to say. There was no trace of the green slime mood now that things were going Howell's way. Sophie noticed... She wanted to slap him. I want you to do a very delicate job, Howell explained. So the king will go on giving me work like transport spells, but not trust me with anything like finding his brother. You must tell him how I've angered the Witch of the Waste and explain what a good son I am to you, but I want you to do it in such a way he'll understand I'm really quite useless. Howell explained in great detail. Sophie clasped her hands round the parcels and tried to take it all in though she couldn't help thinking, if I was the king, I wouldn't understand a word of what the old woman was driving at. Michael, meanwhile, was hovering at Howell's elbow, trying to ask him about the perplexing spell. Howell kept thinking of new, delicate details to tell the king and waving Michael away. Not now, Michael. And it occurred to me, Sophie, you might want some practice in order not to find the palace overwhelming. We don't want you coming over queer in the middle of the interview. Not yet, Michael. So I arranged for you to pay a call to my old tutor, Mrs. Pent Stemmon. She's a grand old thing. In some ways, she's grander than the king. So you'll be quite used to that kind of thing by the time you get to the palace. By this time, Sophie was wishing she'd never agreed. She was heartily relieved when Howell turned at last to Michael. Right, Michael, your turn now. What is it? Michael waved the shiny grey paper and explained in an unhappy rush how impossible the spell seemed to do. Hal seemed faintly astonished to hear this, but he took the paper, saying, Now, where was your problem? and spread it out. He stared at it. One of his eyebrows shot up. I tried it as a puzzle, and I tried doing just what it says, Michael explained, but Sophie and I couldn't catch the falling star. Great gods above, Howell explained. He started to laugh, but bit his lip to stop himself. But Michael, this isn't the spell I left you. Where did you find it? On the bench, in that heap of things Sophie piled around the skull, said Michael. It was the only new spell there, so I thought... How leaped up and sorted among the things on the bench. <sighs> Sophie strikes again, he said. he said. Things skidded left and right as he searched. I might have known, no, the proper spell's not here. He tapped the skull thoughtfully on its brown shiny dome. You're doing, my friend... I have a notion you come from there. I'm sure the guitar does. Uh, Sophie, dear. What? said Sophie. Busy old fool. Unruly Sophie, said Howell. Am I right in thinking that you turned my doorknob black side down and stuck your long lows out through it? Uh, just my finger, Sophie said with dignity. But you opened the door, said Howell, and the thing Michael thinks is a spell must have got through. Didn't it occur to either of you? It doesn't look like spells usually do. Spells often look peculiar, Michael said. What is it, really? Howell gave a snort of laughter. Decide what this is about. Write a second verse. Oh, Lord, he said, and ran for the stairs. I'll show you, he called, as his feet pounded up them. I think we wasted our time rushing out around the marshes last night. Hello. Yeah, we can. Just let me finish this and then we'll do that. Can you come and sit with me? Somebody just woke up. Hmm. Let me 
let's see how. Oh, yeah. Right. Decide what this is about. Write a second verse. Oh Lord, he, ran, he said and ran for the stairs. I'll show you, as he, call, uh, he called as his feet pounded up them. I think we wasted our time rushing around the marshes last night, Sophie said. Michael nodded gloomily. Sophie could see that he was feeling a fool. It was my fault, she said. I opened the door. What was outside? Michael asked with great interest. But Howell came charging downstairs just then. I haven't got that book after all, he said. He seemed upset now. Michael, did I hear you say you went out and tried to catch a shooting star? Yes, but, but it was scared stiff and it fell in a pool and drowned, Michael said. Thank goodness for that, said Hal. It was very sad, Sophie said. Sad, was it? said Hal, more upset than ever. It was your idea, was it? It would be. I can just see you hopping about the marshes encouraging him. Let me tell you, that was the most stupid thing he's ever done in his life. He'd have been more than sad if he'd chanced to catch the thing. And you, Calcifer flickered steeply up the chimney. What's all this fuss about? he demanded. You caught one yourself, didn't you? Yes, and I, Hal began, turning his glass marble glare on Calcifer, but he pulled himself together and turned to Michael instead. Michael, promise me you'll never try to catch one again. I promise, said Michael willingly. What is that writing if it's not a spell? Hal looked at the grey paper in his hand. It's called Song, and that's what it is, I suppose. But it's not all here, and I can't remember the rest of it. He stood and thought as if a new idea had struck him, which obviously worried him. I think the next verse was important, he said. I'd better take it back and see. He went to the door and turned the knob black down, and then he paused. He looked round at Michael and Sophie, who naturally enough were both staring at the knob. All right, he said. I know Sophie will squirm through if I leave her behind, and that's not fair to Michael. Come along, both of you, so I've got you where I can, where I can keep my eye on you. He opened the door on the nothingness and walked into it. Michael fell over the stool in his rush to follow. Sophie shed parcels left and right into the hearth as she sprang up too. Don't let any sparks get on those, she said to Calcifer. If you promise to tell me what's out there, Calcifer said. You've had your hint, by the way. Did I? said Sophie. She was in too much of a hurry to attend. <laughs>